Welcome to Toastmaster Time, the show that has everybody talking. I'm your host, Ashley Harkness, and tonight we have a great show for you. I want to introduce our evaluator, Trish Gray. Trish, tell us about the show tonight. For our initial show in high definition, we have our treat for our audience. We have two speakers. Alex is going to see how her skills in front of an audience translate into studio audience. And then for longtime viewers of our show, they'll recognize our second speaker, James Jeffley. You're going to see his award-winning contest speech. Well, thank you very much. We'll be looking forward to hearing more of your comments later on. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Scher. Alex, welcome to the, the program tonight. Thank you. Well, tell us, how long have you been a Toastmaster now? About 10 months. 10 months, and what brought you to Toastmastering? I have wondered about the organization for years. I did not know much about it. I just heard that it was t to better your public speaking skills. I've thought for years about doing it, and finally, Last July, I said, it's time to check this off my to-do list, and so I did. I'm glad that you have. I think it'll be very interesting, and especially we're on the television tonight. Now, before the show, we talked a little bit about your background, and you told me that you had spent several years with the American Cancer Society. How did that happen? I was first a volunteer in Boston. Mm -hmm. I'm from Massachusetts, and I volunteered for a walk called Making Strides Against Breast Cancer, which is the American Cancer Society's annual walk to fight breast cancer. Okay. And I moved to California, got a job with the organization, and 17 la years later, I was still there. Fantastic. What an experience that's given you. I'll bet you're going to have a lot of opportunities to use some of your adventures there in, in speaking mm -hmm. with Toastmasters. That's yes, really, really surely. great. Well, we're going to hear from your speech. Are you ready? I am. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to get ready for that. And while that's happening, I'm going to tell the audience at home a little bit more about Toastmasters. Toastmasters is an organization where we are very organized, <laughs> goes without saying, to help people to find their leadership potential and also to overcome the fear of public speaking. There are many, many opportunities to do this and we have it organized with different types of manuals to help people that are reflecting the real world that's out there when you have to do speeches. But one of the key parts to Toastmastering is that as we move along and as we do our presentations, we get evaluated. The evaluations are to help us to get better and sometimes to give us some important keys into it, being better speakers. Tonight, our evaluator is Trish Gray. Welcome to the show, Trish. Well, thank you. Okay, tell us about what Alex is going to say. Alex is working from an advanced manual. It's the Communicating on Television manual. She's doing project number two, the talk show. Her objectives are to prepare for the questions that you asked her. And she wants to pre present a positive image for the television camera. And then as appears a guest, as she's doing now. And in general, she asked me to evaluate how well she feels she's able to translate her skills speaking in front of a live audience to skills speaking in a studio audience. Well, and of course, that we, as we know, that's a very different experience. Yes. So thank you very much. I'm going to be asking you some more about that in a minute. But it's time for us to hear our guest speaker, Alex Scher, with her speech, Let's bring back common sense. You look great in that haircut. And you, I love your positive energy. And you, I love our conversations. I always learn something from you. How did that feel to be complimented? It felt good, right? Well, you know what? It felt good to me too. Fellow Toastmasters, and viewers. Do you remember after 9-11, that heaviness that we all felt? It was like a black cloud was hanging over us, pushing down. But there was something that cut through all that. And you know what it was? We were nicer to each other. We didn't walk with our heads down like this. We looked at people and we smiled and we held the door for strangers. And after time, that heaviness, it dissipated, didn't go away, but it faded a little bit, and we went back to our ways. We don't need a tragedy to bring back some common courtesies, little things that we can do every day that make other people feel good and make you feel good at the same time. I'm gonna keep this really simple. I'm gonna give three suggestions of ways we can all do this, and I already gave you one, and that's to compliment. How many of you think compliments, but you don't say them? 
You think them, but you don't say them. You think, that customer service rep was so helpful, but you don't say it. Or you think, I loved his speech last night, but you don't say it. You see a man walking down the street, I like his tie, but you don't say it. Well, I say, say, say the compliment. Obviously, it's going to make the other person feel good, and it's going to make you feel good, too. Here's a tip about complimenting. When possible, compliment the person directly. You heard me say, you look great in that haircut. I said, you look great in that haircut. I didn't say, I like your haircut. Both are true, but I complimented you directly. It's subtle, but it registers. Number two, appreciate and thank. You remember way back when, when you wanted to thank somebody, you got out a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I don't know too many people who do this anymore, but we used to write thank you notes and put them in the mail. Yes, the mail. I think that the art of thanking is lost, but it's so important. If you don't have time to write a thank you note, pick up the phone. If you don't have time to pick up the phone, get on your computer. Dear Joe, thank you so much for lending us your blender. We made the best frozen margaritas we've ever had. Bottoms up. Thanks again. What'd that take? What, nine seconds, maybe? Nine seconds to tell Joe that you appreciated something he did. It's so important to show your gratitude, no matter how big or how small. I'm gonna tell you a story. A friend of mine was going on a trip, a big trip, without her toddler for the first time. And I said, you know, I just did the same thing. And when I was on my trip, I took little videos and I narrated things that I was doing and I sent them to my husband to share with our son. My husband said that our son watched those videos hundreds, literally hundreds of times. What can I say? I make a good video. <laughs> My friend comes back from her trip and she says, Alex, guess what? I did what you suggested. I took videos, I sent them to my daughter, and she loved them. Thank you. Do you know how good that made me feel? I gave advice, no idea whether she's going to take it or not, took the advice, it worked for her. She looped back with me and told me how much she appreciated it. It made me feel so good. Take the time to appreciate and thank. Number three. I'm going to show you what number three is. You ready? Ding. <laughs> smile. Did you know that research says that when you smile, not only do you make the other person feel good, but you feel better, even if you're in a rotten mood? Interesting, right? I'm going to tell you a story that I will admit to you, it is embarrassing, but I've come to terms with it, and I'm okay sharing it with you. Okay. Years ago, I realized something I was doing. When I would do a transaction at a store, this is what it looked like. I gave the money, I'd get my change, thank you. I didn't even look at the person, let alone smile at them. I just gave money to a stranger, and I didn't even know what that person looked like. I knew that something had to change. So now I look at people and I smile at them. Sometimes I just reach around the counter and I give them a big hug and a kiss. <laughs> That's not true. I do not do that. And I do not suggest you do that either. But I do suggest that you smile. Have you ever heard the song by Crosby, Stills and Nash? If you smile at me, I will understand. Cause that is something everybody everywhere knows in the same language. Beautiful, right? I mean, the sentiment, not my voice. Although maybe that's beautiful. <laughs> See, I told you I was going to keep it simple. Compliment, appreciate and thank, and smile. Three simple things that we can do every day that make other people feel good and make you feel good at the same time. We do not need a tragedy to give us perspective and make us nicer to people. So please, join me and let's bring back common courtesies. Thank you. Very good, very good. Well, Trish, what's your evaluation? This was such a wonderful speech, especially considering her topic. And when I think about it, she was trying to 
see how her skills in front of a live audience translated to the studio audience where there's nobody here, just you and I and a few camera people hiding behind cameras. And so how do you have that? And she's all about making people feel better and, you know, complimenting people and tell people you appreciate them and smile. And a part of me sitting there going, you know, do you feel stupid smiling when you're not smiling at anybody? She was able to internalize the fact, okay, maybe there's not someone right in front of her right there that she's smiling at, but she knows that when this show is aired, there will be someone watching, and you could tell she was smiling at that person. So I thought, first of all, it was she translated her skills very well to the studio environment. Just as a speech, it was very well organized. She said she's going to have her three main points. She had her main, three main points about complimenting people, appreciating them, and smiling. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I also loved how she used her stories to illustrate what, it's, you know, especially about, you know, reaching across the, the counter and hugging and kissing that, that person, you know, so that was just a way to add some levity and, and you know, make it a little bit more interesting. So, so I thought she did were a you inspired? Job. You know, I, you know, we're smiling, you know, so yes. we'll just have to see how much that smile translates to the rest of the show because I thought she did a wonderful job. Mm, I thought she was very enthusiastic, and I think the communication went right into the camera. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you very much. We'll hear more later on. But right now, it's time for Toastmasters time to take a break. Name an effective political leader in history who couldn't speak well. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. There aren't any. Because when it comes to a disease... Freedom like requires Mexican, leadership, no and leadership requires parties. oratory. You have to speak to be heard. I have a dream. It's all about personal growth and guts. Never give in. Never, never, never. Welcome back to Toastmaster Time, the show that has everybody talking. I have our guest with us, James Jeffley. James, welcome to Toastmaster Time. Thank you, Ashley. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm glad you are, too. You, you're not a stranger to Toastmaster Time. You've been on it before, I think. I've been here a couple of times or so. What is one of the lessons you learned from all your experience standing in front of that eye the camera puts on you? Be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. That's very good. Well, tell us a little bit more about where you're from. I mean, in terms of what Toastmaster Club. Club 9389 in Oakland, California. It's mm -hmm. East Bay Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. How long have you been a Toastmaster? A year and a half. A year and a half. And in a year and a half, you've had an awful lot of experience doing a lot of things. Have you seen that there are many leadership opportunities in Toastmasters? They're virtually endless, whether you want to participate as a club officer or you want to be involved in contests mm -hmm. or organizing special events or as you become a more advanced Toastmaster of doing a high performance leadership project and doing something impactful out in the community. Mm, there's no shortage of opportunities to serve. It sounds to me like you are encouraging people perhaps as maybe even the president of a club maybe? Absolutely. That's yeah, pretty interesting, pretty interesting. Well, are you uh, prepared to give your presentation tonight? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to get ready. And while that is happening, I'll tell our audience a little bit more about Toastmasters and how it works. So Toastmasters is an international organization. There's over 18,000 clubs worldwide. If you're a Toastmaster in one club, you're a Toastmaster in all of them. A little over a quarter of a million people have joined Toastmasters right now. And what you find is... These people are learning leadership and taking the opportunities to get over any kind of problems they have with public speaking and becoming leaders in their community. It's really a very interesting and wonderful experience. I encourage all of you to do that. But now it's time for us to hear from James Jeffley, our speaker, with his title, The Line. I have been speaking in front of audiences since I was five years old. By the time I was 16, I had already won a number of speech and debate contests. I'd even gone to a national championship by my junior year in high school. In my senior year, I decided to finally take a speech class. I thought it would be an easy A. I remember walking into that class full of accomplishments, pride, and arrogance. 
my teacher asked if I would give one of my award-winning speeches. I obliged, and when I finished, she gave me her feedback. I'll never forget this. She looked at me and she said, Mr. Jeffley, that was an outstanding speech. It was well-written and delivered. And then she said four words that would serve as a turning point in my life. She said, but it wasn't you. Oh my, I did not see that coming. She continued, I don't know who that was giving that speech, if it was a character or, or an impression, but it wasn't you. You see, Mr. Jeffley, there's a difference between saying something well and saying something real. <sighs> I was speechless. I just stood there, my ego burst, pride and arrogance oozing out of me, and the only thing I could remember in that moment were the lyrics to a James Brown song. I was talking loud and saying nothing. And she saw right through me. And she called me out. But in hindsight, she called me forth. She challenged me to be real. You see, until that moment, I wasn't aware of the line. There's a line that clearly separates what is real and authentic from whatever I was doing over here in this speech. I couldn't see it, but my teacher could see it clearly. And I swore from that day, I was going to be real. Little did I know, I set myself up for the most difficult struggle of my life. Because I had no idea how hard it was going to be to be real in this world. I grew up with two parents, a Native American father who recently passed and an African American mother. So I had two different ideas of what real meant from two different cultural backgrounds. Add to that teachers and family and friends and school and politics and religion and media and movies and books and magazines and all of these people, all of these different ideas and voices about what it was to be real. I was confused. Every now and then I could hear my own little voice leading me over towards the line, towards something real, only to find myself being snatched back over here by the desire to fit in. And the more I listened to all those different voices, the more I realized how they all started to sound the same, undifferentiated, unremarkable, unreal. You see, there really is a difference in life on both sides of the line. On that side of the line, you would find the real unapologetic, unvarnished, unpolished me, the courageous me, the accept me just as I am, warts and all, me. But over here, on this side of the line, ho oh, oh, you get the polished, practiced version of me, the idea of me, the story of me, the me that you think I am, the me that has sacrificed authenticity at the altar of wanting to be liked, the me that lives in fear of your criticism, your judgment, and your opinions, the me that actually has something real to say, but who often lacks the courage to say it. One of my great teachers, Osho, once said, you cannot tell the truth unless you're courageous. You cannot be loving unless you're courageous. Hence, courage comes first and everything else follows. You see, if I had the courage to live on that side of the line, I would say four words to every young man whose underwear I see. Pull up your pants. Stop trying to live out a fashion statement whose origins you know nothing about. If I had the courage to live on that side of the line, I would say four things to every corporation. Equal pay for women. Why? Because it's beyond time. And if I had the courage to live on that side of the line, I would finally admit to you and the rest of the world something that I've been holding on to as a secret for the last four years. Something that until about three weeks ago, I had only told four other people something that if I admitted it, 
it would mean that my version of happily ever after was gone. And some of you might think of me as a failure. But as one of those four friends often reminds me, James, you are as sick as the secrets you keep. Well, I'm tired of being sick, and I'm tired of keeping secrets. My marriage of almost 25 years is over. And I can admit that now because I found the courage, because it takes courage to be well and I choose to be well. And so it doesn't really matter what anyone thinks or what anyone says. Because I would rather live on this side of the line in truth than to merely exist on this side of the line another day in fear. So I'm choosing now. I'm choosing real. And I'm choosing to live on that side of the line. And if you want, you could too. Who's with me? Thank you, James. James Jeffrey. This is Toastmaster time, and it's time for us to take a break. We'll be right back. Name an effective political leader in history who couldn't speak well. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. There aren't any. Because when it comes to a disease Freedom like requires this, leadership, no and leadership requires parties. oratory. You have to speak to be heard. I have a dream. It's all about personal growth and guts. Never give in. Never, never, never. back to Toastmaster Time, the show that has everybody talking. With me is James Jeffley, who was just our speaker. And James, that was a very powerful speech you presented to us. Thank you, Ashley. And it came from a lot of different difficult parts, I can tell. And the theme that I really kept hearing was he had to have the courage to make those choices. Absolutely. You had that courage. Where did that come from? It wasn't easy. But I kept remembering that line about Osho from, from him and that everything you want to do that's of significance requires courage. Mm -hmm. Courage is the tipping point. Mm -hmm. Once you begin with that, everything else is possible. And it's not always easy to get there, but at some point I had to realize that I was either going to live on that side of the line in truth or I was going to continue over here behind facades and fences. Lots of fear you had to overcome, right? Absolutely. Mm. It seems like it wasn't something you did instantaneously, but you had to work at. I did. I've had a number of close friends who have pushed and prodded and gently nudged me uh, and gave me the space to make some decisions on my own, and I realized all along they were right. In your speech, you made a comment about being raised basically in two cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Did you find that to be very discordant and difficult? At times I did, and then I got to a point where I, I thought I realized that that didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. I viewed myself as James, the human being, mm -hmm. and that's how I wanted other people to treat me. Mm -hmm. And that eliminated some of the discord that was going on in my head. Mm -hmm. I see. This was a, um, a transition that took time. It's like you traveled through all of these different changes. Yes. And you've come out on the other side on your side of the line that you want to be on in a much better way. How do you feel about that? It's a little scary, honestly, because mm -hmm. I've become accustomed to doing this other thing for so long, but it's also refreshing in that I no longer have to have pretense or hide behind certain things. I can just be real and say what I need to say. Do you often see other people presenting on different levels and wonder about what their real goals are and how, how they maybe might be better off? Oh, all the time, whether it's people presenting their manual speeches at our club or people presenting their speeches at contests. 
I often wonder what the backstory is and how they got to the point where they decided to share whatever they shared in their speech and what else is going on for them in their life. I like the way you constructed the speech. You took us on a journey with you. And in that journey, you took us also to a challenge at the end saying, you could do this too. Come with me. That's a very good way to involve the people in that. Was that something that you thought of or how did that happen? How did that come about? I, I wanted the, the speech to not be so much about me. I wanted it to have value mm. for everyone listening. And I realized that my challenges are, everyone else has similar challenges. Mm -hmm. And it really boils down to courage and ultimately making a decision. And so I wanted to give the audience an opportunity to make that decision for themselves. I'm willing to step across this line. If you wanted to, you can too. Mm. Who's with me? Mm -hmm. Do you have a follow-on speech you think you'll be doing with this? I've always got a follow-on <laughs> speech. It just depends on what comes up. Something tells me that's part of Toastmastering, don't you think? <laughs> You're always working for the next speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Toastmasters is certainly an opportunity for you to grow. It sounds to me like the proof of it is in your speech that you just gave it, and that's very helpful. I want to thank you very much for being here with us tonight on Toastmaster Time. Thank you, Ashley. It's time for us to get going in closing. This is Toastmaster Time, the show that has everybody talking. If you're interested in hearing more about it, there's lots of places where you can get information. First of all, there's our website at toastmastertime.com. Our district is district 57 d 57 tm Dot com. And then Toastmasters is produced by Toastmasters International, District 57. We cover Northern California. And the studios are in Palo Alto at the Media Center. On behalf of Toastmasters, everywhere, Toastmasters Television, I want to thank the staff of the Media Center and all of the people who have made this, this show possible, the crew behind the scenes and our guests and our speakers. That's our show. Thanks for watching Toastmaster Time. We hope you have time for Toastmasters soon.